are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to Ransomware, the healthcare industry's privacy and security tipping point. Um, that's really my premise, not necessarily the, the, the topic uh, of today's uh, webinar. Uh, my name is Carlos Leva. I'm the CEO of Three Lines Publishing, the, publishing, the publisher of the HIPAA Survival Guide. I'm also an attorney and managing partner with the Digital Business Law Group. Um, what we're going to cover today is what is ransomware, how prevalent is it, how uh, does it impact covered entities versus business associates, uh, and how to best stop it. And just by a show of hands, I think I would know the answer to this. I think I know the answer to this. How many of you, whether you're covered entities or business associates, are more worried about ransomware than any other kind of, you know, bio, HIPAA violation? How many, you know, for how many of you is ransomware now become the top of the list? Okay, Martin, are we getting a large show of hands? Um. Yeah, I'd say uh, uh, somewhere between uh, 40 to 60 percent, yeah. Okay. It, it should be probably 100 percent. Uh, we're going to try to define it, but it's not, it's really not complex from a, a definition perspective, okay? And it's, it's really not all that new, uh, but there's been a lot of high-profile instances lately that has everybody talking about it. So ransomware is a type of malware that prevents or limits users from accessing their system. This type of malware forces victims to pay the ransom through certain online payment methods, usually Bitcoin, so that it's untraceable in order to grant access to their systems or to get their data back. So here's the thing about ransomware, okay? For me, it was probably three months ago now, maybe four, I can't remember, and things happen so fast, to lose track of time. There was a ransomware incident that happened in Melbourne, Australia. And what was insidious about it was not only did the hackers take control of the protected health information, they actually started changing it. Now, anybody in healthcare that is a clinician or has just been around healthcare understands that if patient A starts reflecting patient B or patient C's chart or some combination of that, and patient A gets the wrong meds, the wrong interventions, sooner rather than later somebody's going to die. Okay? That's, that's why everybody is concerned about ransomware because the, because the bad guys can not only hold you up, which by itself could kill people if you don't pay the ransom quick enough, but they could even be more insidious and start actually changing the data, the patient data. Okay? So they have some tools at their disposal that could cause your patients to die. If your patients start dying, you're going to have a bad day. If you're the compliance officer, if you're the lowly nurse, LPN, if you're the chief medical officer, if you're the CEO, you're probably going to have a bad day. You may not even be in existence a month or two later, okay? That is why ransomware has caught everyone's attention. The bad guys are just upping the ante, okay? They're just getting smarter. Now, let me tell you, it, even if we had a good economic environment worldwide, right, even if this was the late 90s and we had budget surpluses and everybody was rolling high, this obviously would still be a problem. But in a global economic environment where there is no growth anywhere, China's slowing down, you know, the, the developing countries, India and Russia and Brazil, they're all slowing down, okay? There is no growth anywhere. Does anybody think that um, people and computers keep getting cheaper and cheaper? What do you think these thousands or millions of people with, with the skills are going to do to feed their families if it comes down to starving or hacking somebody's system and holding them up for money, especially if in, they're in Russia or China or someplace we can't get to and they can get payment via Bitcoin? In other words, we got a really, really serious problem on our hand that 
is not going to get better anytime soon. Okay, and so the question is, you know, it, 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 the trend. Um, first of all, it's nothing new. Okay, this is nothing new. The first reported instances were circa 2005, 2006. Some Russian hackers started doing this. Okay, what is somewhat new? is the vengeance by which this type of malware is attacking the healthcare industry. Why? Why the healthcare industry? Because everybody knows, including everybody on this webinar, knows that the healthcare industry has mostly, by and large, stuck its head in its sand, in the sand for privacy and security reasons. HIPAA, SHMIPA, doctors say, I'd rather go to jail. We're not doing it. We're not paying attention. We're not going to do yearly risk assessment. The list goes on and on and on. Anybody in healthcare understands that, right? That is the view of healthcare. Therefore, healthcare hasn't done, not only has healthcare not complied with high tech, healthcare is so vulnerable that it's easy pickings for the bad guys. Because even HIPAA compliance, which is like compliance 101, which is just like laying down the basic foundation, would not be enough to stop the ransomware epidemic. Right? But if you don't have the basics in place, how on earth? Are you going to take the next steps that actually protect your organization from ransomware? So the bad guys uh, have figured it out, and you know what? You know, it doesn't take rocket science that the health that the U.S. healthcare industry is more than vulnerable. It's just easy pickings for them. Okay, so it's easy for me to predict. I don't have to be the Panama Institute. I don't have to do the study. I guarantee you that ransomware over the next couple of years is going to explode. All right, you heard it here first because it just makes too much sense. You got an easy victim, you got cheap computers, and you got talent available uh, worldwide that doesn't have other ways to earn a decent living. All those things are going to conspire to make ransomware, make the ransomware ep epidemic continue. I'm going to just pause here and see if there's any questions. Not at this time. Okay, I'm sure um, I, I probably have your attention. Why? Well, we, we, we just talked about the why, right? And the bad guys everywhere, they know it. They know how weak the healthcare industry is. Everybody knows it. There's, it's all over the press. This isn't news. I'm not telling the bad guys something that they don't know. They already know this. They're pretty sophisticated. Okay? They know the healthcare industry is soft. What do I mean by soft? Well, if you compare what the healthcare industry has done vis-a-vis -vis privacy and security with what the financial services, the financial services industry, online banking, yada, yada, they're 10 to 15 years ahead of what the healthcare industry uh, has done, which for the most part what the healthcare industry has done is absolutely nothing, stuck their, head, stuck their collective heads in the sand, except for maybe Kaiser, per Kaiser Permanente and some of the big guys, right? That leaves thousands and thousands and thousands of business associates and, um, and CEs that have basically just ignored the problem. Okay, not only have they ignored the, 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 the problem, they haven't even done the basics. They haven't even complied with the High Tech Act, let alone you know this. So, needless to say, if ransomware continues, and not if, but when a patient or two or three or four die because of this, you can imagine the pressure that the you that, that the that the public and then that the U.S. government is going to place on the healthcare industry to say, you know what, we've given you now damn near a decade, you know, well, at least six years, seven years out from 2009 when the High Tech Act was implemented, we've given you running on a decade, right, to get your act together, and you have collectively done almost absolutely nothing. Now. If you don't believe that the U.S. government, uh, based, based on the fact that the public is going to be screaming and the news media is going to be covering this because, because we know the American media loves dirty laundry, and when people die, that's about as bad as it gets, then the hammer is going to come down in a very, very big way. And there is enough hammer in the High Tech Act for it to come down. Let me tell you just how easy the hammer comes down. So. Whether or not you guys know it, I, mo a lot of you do, there's a new round of audits coming out, right? And part of that new round of audits is called desk audits, which means nothing but 
we got a bunch of interns that are calling up covered entities and business associates and saying, hey, give me your privacy policy, your security policy, give me the results of your last uh, risk assessment, and give me, uh, tell, you know, give, give me the spreadsheet or reports that track when all of your people have been trained, whatever it is. Guess how many people covered entities and, and business associates could actually pass that test? Maybe 5%, maybe 10%. Okay? Then they got enough to come out and do a full-scale audit. Well, if you start getting people dying from ransomware, those, those, those desk audits, instead of having 25 interns, you could probably have 1,000 uh, interns getting those desk audits. Okay? So the wolf, the man is coming, and the man should be coming because it's a serious, it's a serious problem, and it's not going to go away. So, you know, the... the, um, the the attitude of the healthcare industry that we can just stick our head in the sands, or if the Republicans win, they're going to repeal Obamacare, and this is, all, and this is not going away. This has nothing to do with Obamacare. You know, it, it, it's just doing business in the 21st century. Okay, the world has changed, and the healthcare industry hasn't caught up. Now, the bad guys, according to the Panaman report that just came out a couple of days ago, they account for over 50% of the breaches in the healthcare industry. The other 50% are counted by negligence, right? So just by doing non-stupid things like don't allow PHI on uh, mobile devices, pads, PCs, phones, just as a matter of policy, so you're not going to allow it. You could probably prevent 50% of the bad things, 50% of the breaches. You're not going to you're not going to prevent the bad guys, though. So this 50% number uh, is a really really big number, right? And uh, the data says that uh, of the people that reported to the Panaman Institute, 90% of the covered entities said they had two breaches or more last year. It's 90%. Obviously, obviously, they're not reporting that to HHS or the wall of shame, which would be much, much bigger than it really is. Okay? Martin, any questions now? No, Martin went to sleep on me again, too. No, I'm no, gonna... I'm, no, I'm here. There's nothing yet. They're just stunned. Okay, so this is what I just said. The majority of covered entities report two breaches during the prior year. That doesn't surprise me, okay? There's only two types of companies, though that those that know that, that they've been breached uh, and those that have been breached. Those that, do, those that have been breached and know it and those that have been breached and don't know it, okay? That's it. Everybody's been breached. And the cost, according to the Panaman Institute again, the Pony Month, is six billion a year in growing. That's six B, six billion dollars a year. And you know, there's no end in sight right now, given where the healthcare industry is on the privacy and security compliance continuum. See, this is this is no longer compliance as a necessary evil, or compliance as some abstract thing we do you know, for, you know, managing risks. This is compliance to save your butt, to save your business model, to add value to what you actually provide to your customers, to be able to say you actually have an effective strategy uh, for dealing with ransomware, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so, so the consensus is that most BAs are relying on policies and procedures. I would say, given my experience in the market uh, and my interaction with the market, that I would say this is not true. I would say that that um, that most CEs and BAs do not have effective policies and procedures in place, and the vast majority, even if they did, don't have tracking mechanisms to make sure that they are in fact compliant. So there's three things you have to have in place to comp to to comply with a requirement. Okay, and as we know, there's 169 requirements built into the privacy rule, security rule, and the breach notification rule. Okay, but there's like 78 or something in the privacy, 80 something in uh, security rule, and 10 in breach notification rule. For each one of those requirements, for each one, you need a policy, you need a set of processes that implement that policy, and you need a set of tracking mechanisms that track process results. So if you have policies, processes, and tracking mechanisms at the granularity level of a requirement, then you can 
effectively say that you have visible demonstrable evidence that you're complying with that requirement. So let me give you an example. You may have a training policy that says we're going to train our people once a year on HIPAA and any time that the law uh, changes or any time that we have a, a breach or something, we're going to redo training. Okay, that's your policy. So then if I'm an auditor, I'm like, well, what's your process? How do you train your people? Is it classroom training? Is it video-based training? Do they have to take a test? You know, how, how, how exactly do you do that? How do you go about fulfilling this policy? Because policies, right, without processes are just empty, flowery language and promises, what you intend to do, not what you actually did. And then if you can convince me, and I'm an auditor, that you have effective process, then I'm going to say, okay, well, show me when Dr. Uh, John Smith last got trained. Sh uh, show me with, uh, you know, where uh, Nurse Sharon Cohen last got trained. Show me where you know, John Doe last got trained and what they got trained on. Show me the results. And if you can't show me the results, then I'm just going to say, you know what, you're absolutely not complying. You can't show me that you're complying because you don't have visible demonstrable evidence that you're complying. And even if you did, we're complying with HIPAA, that is not going to be enough to stop the ransomware epidemic, okay? Ransomware is taking things out of the realm of compliance into the realm of if the healthcare industry as we know it wants to survive, and obviously it does because we can't live without a healthcare industry, they're going to have to up their game. Okay? This is compliance is not a necessary evil anymore. Compliance is at um, at the heart of the matter. Right? Compliance is part of how you deliver quality health care to your patients. Another topic that's going to be on the rise and start trending is going to be data breach insurance. Okay, that's already uh, hot and it'll get hotter. But here's the thing: how much insurance do you need? Let's just do an exercise. If you bought a hundred thousand dollars worth of insurance, how far do you you think that would go, even for a small breach? Okay, let me give you an example, and I'm using super conservative numbers. So the Panama Institute used to say says now not used to say says now that in healthcare, a, a per record, it costs about three hundred and sixteen dollars. By the time you notify, gather the information, so on and so forth, all kinds of variables that they include in there, three hundred and sixteen dollars. More expensive than other industries. But let's forget three hundred and sixteen dollars because I tend to think the Ponemon Institute is exaggerating those numbers a little bit. Okay, I don't really believe them because they're like they're kind of like going out of business numbers. You know what I mean? It's just it would put people out of business. So. When we never see anybody actually reporting the kind of cost that the Bonnemont Institute says it costs, but let's just be conservative for this hypothetical. Let's say that it costs per record $200, okay? If you had a very tiny breach of 5,000 records, that would be a million dollars in notification costs. And you haven't really talked about fines, class action lawsuits, reputation damage, et cetera, et cetera. 5,000 records. How many records can fit on a thumb drive now? Millions. Okay? So so what if you had $100,000 coverage? <laughs> that's going to that's gonna disappear in legal fees alone probably in the first couple of months. See? But, so there's no panacea. There's no panacea here, right? The, the insurers know that this is expensive. Sure, you might be able to get breach insurance, but they may be selling you something that's snake oil because when in fact you actually have to use it, it's not going to nearly cover uh, what you needed. Okay? So if you're looking at, I mean, I, I, I would tell my clients, I do tell my client, you know, if you don't have like one to five million and that would be on the low side, just why have it at all? $100,000 policy is just insane. It's not going to cover anything for you. So. And the insurers don't quite know what they're doing right now because there's not a long history of covering these data breaches. So the pricing is going to be all over the map. And guess what they're going to guess what they're going to do? They're going to do what they always do, right? They're going to overprice it by an order of magnitude, a, and b. They're going to try to get out of coverage every chance they get. They're going to look for every nook and cranny to put in clauses as to when you have to notify them, oops, you missed your notification date, sorry, coverage doesn't apply. They're going to have all these preconditions that trigger the insurance. And I guarantee you there are people that have insurance today, like errors and emissions and blah, 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 and they don't even know it. And they wait so long that 
They've been paying this premium for so many years, and they wait six months instead of 30 days to notify the insurance company. Now the insurance company says, nope, we're not going to cover. And then what happens? Well, then you wind up suing your insurance company over coverage. And meanwhile, you have to eat all these notification costs because that suit of the insurance company is probably going to take a couple years to resolve. Okay, so caveat emptor, right? If this data breach insurance thing is, you know, it's just, it's really early in the game. And if you think that you're buying a uh, restful sleep just because you got insurance, then, um, then think, think again, okay? Now, we talked about this. There are lots of things you can do and you should do, common sense things. Like just implement the basics of HIPAA. All right? It's not evil. It's doing business in the 21st century. And maybe if you did that, you could eliminate this 50% that's just dumb. Like people putting um, PHI on a laptop, and then a laptop gets lost, stolen, left in the car, even PCs. Right? So bad guys come in, and they're looking for something to steal. They just grab PCs, laptops, blah, blah, blah. Oh, and then they find out that, oh, here, hey, there's 500,000 records of PHI right here. Hmm, what do you know? Well, if all that PHI had been on a, a server within the server room, had two-factor authentication, and it couldn't really get in, well, they're not going to, you know, they're not going to stand around trying to break into the server room. They got to get in, get out, uh, or they're going to get caught. Right? The alarms are probably going off. So, you know, you can't sit around and do nothing. And as 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 important as ransomware is, first, just get the basics in place, and then you can start actually building your compliance program to where maybe you can start effectively dealing with something as complex and as insidious as ransomware. But if you don't have training, policy, procedures, blah, 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 for that 101 stuff covered in HIPAA, then you're just DOA. I mean, you might as well just keep your head in the sand because sooner or later that, that uh, ax is going to fall and somebody's going to get their head cut off, right? Um, and hopefully it won't be you if you're the compliance officer, but probably if you're the compliance officer, it will be you. You and the CEO, somebody's going to go. Right, because you know you stuck your head in the sand. And you didn't even do the basics and willful neglect. Fines start at fifty thousand dollars per violation. So, first instance that people start dying from ransomware, the whole game is going to change. And that's why I said finally, ransomware is probably the healthcare tipping point, where healthcare executives will actually start paying attention to their compliance officers actually start paying attention to their security officers, okay? Because now, hello, 16 years into the 21st century, they're starting to get it, that the game has changed. I have a few questions. Okay. <clears throat> the first question is, um, and I think you just covered this very basically, wanted to know if you're saying that 50% of the incursions by the bad guys are preventable. Oh, no, I didn't say they were preventable. I'm quoting the Ponymon Institute and saying that 50% occur because of hacking. Okay? Yeah. Okay. We'll get, to the, we'll get to the preventable, how you prevent, but I can tell you one thing. Uh, no, the consensus, the consensus wisdom is now that the, that the perimeter can't be defended. Okay? And that's consensus, CIA, FBI, government you know, large private sector organizations that are really doing what you should be doing here. The consensus now is you have to assume that the bad guys can get in because they're, because because of the Internet of Things, there are thousands of vectors where they could get in, and then you have to then say, okay, assuming that they get in, how do we harden what we have? So, no, no, I'm not saying that they could be prevented. It's, it's how do you deal with it? Okay. Uh, the next question is, how, is there any way to protect ag ourselves against ransomware? Well, we're going to talk about that. That's, that's the second half of, um, you know, what we're going to talk about. Okay. So uh, I, I, would say, I would say that we've, we've talked about it in part, right? If you, haven't, if you don't have the basics in place right now, if you haven't, if you haven't been able to convince your uh, – well, first of all, let me back up. If you're a business associate, life is really changing for you. Because the covered entities, even though they may not be in compliance, they're starting to ask you pretty serious questions about how are you in compliance. Show me how you're in compliance. Show me your policies and procedures, blah, 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 right? And if you can't show them, then you're not going to win the business. 
right? So I get clients all the time, business associate clients saying, hey, help us because we're not in compliance, we're not going to win the business. So business associates almost have to comply or, or your business is going to be dried up. That's just compliance now is just a cost of doing business. If you're a business associate and you're sticking your head in the sand, you got a real problem, right? Because maybe the hospital, just for obvious reasons, can't go completely out of business, but your business can disappear, all right? Whether you're doing, uh, you know, uh, administrative work that, that takes PHI, you know, where you're doing whatever, billing, you know, that takes PHI, whatever it is that you're doing, if you're not compliant, you're likely going to be losing your business, and God forbid you have, not, not the if, but when you have a breach, and if somebody looks at what you've done, you're definitely going to lose your business, okay? So, you know, uh, uh, more and more business associates are coming out of the woodwork because they don't have a choice. They don't have a, an, an option. They have to be compliant just to win the business. Martin, anything else? Yes. This is a, sort of an opinion. Sounds like ransomware is for the lazy hacker, someone that does not want the PHI to make money wants to get money from stopping the practice from access to the PHI, yes or no? I, I, no, I wouldn't. I don't know why you would call them lazy. I mean, I don't know what, what on what grounds, right? Because just because they, they, they encrypted your PHI so that you can't use it and they're holding you up for ransom doesn't mean that they're not taking it out the back door and selling it on the black market, right? I mean, why would you, why would you think that they're lazy? They're not. These are smart people. They're not, you know, they probably, they work just as hard in their 9 to 5s or 9 to 12, you know. Well, yeah, I mean, if I was a hacker, if you were a hacker, and I wanted money, I would encrypt it, and I would take the PHI out the back door and start selling it. I would do both. Why would I just do one? So maybe there are some stupid uh, hackers out there, but you know what? Don't assume that. Don't assume that. These guys are, are not stupid, A, and they're getting smarter every day. That's it for the moment. Oh, wait a minute. If you are affected by ransomware, is this something that can be considered a crime and should be reported to police? Oh, it's absolutely a crime. It's extortion, right? It's extortion, but, here, okay, think of this scenario. It's absolutely a crime, but you have the Russian mafia. They're working out of what St. Petersburg, Leningrad. I don't know, right? And or or Czechoslovakia, or, or they're somewhere in China. How how is our FBI going to get to them? Even if our FBI is going through Interpol, they probably need like nine day lead time to get a warrant to track them down. I mean, by that time, bad guys are gone. So yes, it's absolutely a felony. And if some American got caught, they'd spend a large part of their life in jail. But you know, these guys are coming in from everywhere else. That's what I'm saying. And given the global that's why I said the global economy, right? Given the fact that there's no growth and no good jobs anywhere right now, what do you think people with talent are going to turn to? Let me see, starvation or ransomware? Starvation or ransomware? You decide. What would you do, right? This is not, this is, this is obvious. It's so, nobody talks about it, right? But it's so obvious that it's going to happen that you don't need to be a rocket scientist. You don't need to be the Panama Institute for me to, to tell you that ransomware is going to explode. It's just flat out going to explode, right? It's it's like as, as basic, um, it, you know, as it, it, basic as just 101, like like the fact that you should have a named security officer and a named privacy officer, and if you don't, you're in violation of HIPAA, right? And if you don't know that that you should have a named privacy and security officer, well, you're probably in willful neglect because that's about as basic as it gets. Ransomware is going to continue to happen. It's going to affect the privacy rules, affect the security rule, affect the breach notification rule, affect everything related to high tech. Right? Yes, it's yes, it's a felony, but good luck trying to catch the bad guys. Right? The bad guys ain't going to be easily caught. Okay, so this is our compliance equation. This is what we talked about for each requirement. If you have policies plus processes plus tracking mechanisms. At the granularity level of a requirement, you have visible demonstrable evidence of compliance, and you're on your way to establishing a culture of compliance. These are really nice words that HHS uses, culture of compliance, and it's true in general, okay? But when it comes to ransomware, this is the 101 stuff. This is just HIPAA compliance. It's necessary but not sufficient. Just the fact that you've got these policies and processes in place is not going to stop ransomware. Okay, ransomware is this whole other animal, right? It's just taking 
the evil hacking to an entirely different level, right? And the level, the best example I can give you is what happened in Melbourne. I, I, first of all, let me say this. I know of no ransomware attempt where the hospital or the clinic or whatever has not paid. They've all paid because now that all the records are electronic, what are they going to do? Kill their own patients or let patients die or give patients the wrong meds or forget to give patients the meds? They have to pay the ransom. Right, so my point is, if nothing, this is why this could be the tipping point for healthcare. If nothing has changed the healthcare mindset, ransomware is probably the thing that is finally starting to break through and say, "Oh shit, we live in the 21st century, 24/7 online universe where some kid in Ghana or Nigeria or Leningrad or St. Petersburg uh, or, or anywhere, right, with a computer." can get into my system, encrypt it, and hold me up for money, and through Bitcoin and other ways become, you know, the ransom becomes almost untraceable. That's a shock. That's, that just, that, that put, should put you on notice that you are living in an entirely different world than even what was possible, what people thought of four or five years ago. Anything else? Yeah, um, interesting dialogue about data breach insurance. What factor in the cost equation should be set aside for mop-up operations to recover health records? I would think there's a cost per record that needs to be factored in on top of breach insurance to hire a PII recovery team to augment. Yeah, I mean, there's so, there's so many variables in that insurance calculation. That's what I'm saying, that it's really that the insurers, the insurers themselves, even if it's the big insurers, they don't quite know what they're doing right now, right? Because there's so many factors. Think of the, think of what you're trying to cover, okay? So notification cost. We already talked about a small breach of 5,000 records at a super conservative Ponemon Institute of $200 per record instead of 316. That's a million bucks. 5,000 records is a really small breach, right? So what if it was 20,000, right? The, the, what, you know, what is it, 50,000? I mean, those numbers grow up, and that's just notification costs, right? Now it's not the forensics to make sure that you have data integrity after the fact. That's probably not counting your class action lawsuits that, you know, uh, who knows how much that may cost and even if you wind up winning, what your legal fees are going to be. All those variables are almost impossible to predict right now. We, can, we, don't have any, we don't have any track record of it. So, you know, yes, people are going to be buying insurance just because you've got to have some coverage, but it, it, it's com a complete roll of the dice. Uh, as to uh, any any type of certainty of exactly what you're getting for that coverage, and and just knowing what the insurance companies typically do, they're going to have you know those 50-page contracts that with all that fine print that try to exclude stuff, right? So it's a tricky it's a tricky business, uh, and if you're thinking about something like hundred thousand dollars or two hundred thousand dollars of coverage, you might as well not waste your money because it's not going to help you anyway. If we have off-site backup, would ransomware have that as well, or is that the way to get our data back? Yeah, I mean, obviously, off-site backups are, are protection, right? But think about it. Think about, from a practical perspective, how this has worked. They have your, they have your EHR, your electronic health record system. They have the live data. Even if you encrypted it, they might just be able to encrypt the encryption so that even if your stuff is encrypted and they can't actually get the data. So in that scenario, they couldn't be selling it in the black market out the back door, right? Because because they, they let's say that they, they, they couldn't break your encryption, but they encrypted what you encrypted. Now they have your electronic health records, the live data that you have, they have encrypted, which means, what does that mean? Well, it means they have access to your network. They're inside, okay? And they got a bunch of guns that are loaded. And what are you going to do with your backup tape? Because your backup tape is going to be what? You're going to you're going to overwrite what they've encrypted. What's to stop them from just encrypting it again? Or you're going to set up an entirely new server, back it up to that server, re-implement your EHR system and Boot it, maybe, maybe you have to, maybe you have to, uh, you know, that's the way you go. But 
anybody ever tried some of that? I was in IT for 20 years before I started practicing law. Anybody want to venture a guess for a big hospital how long that might take? I, days would be small to get that environment up and running. So theoretically, yes. Yes, you, you could. It's possible. And you could do that. And maybe by that time you got them out, right? But, you know, that's, that's a complex task. Right? And that might take you a week. How are you going to deal with your patients for a week without their charts? I mean, it's insidious how much control they have once they've gotten to that level. No one has asked the question, so I'll ask the question. If I get ransomware, is that a breach that I need to report to HIPAA? Yes. And the reason that it's a breach is that the integrity the integrity and availability of your data is part of the security rule, and that would be a breach. Okay? They may, they may not have taken your data. Let's say your data was encrypted, but they made your data unavailable, okay? uh, and that constitutes a breach. So yes, it would be a breach. You would have to report it. Um, you know, would you have notification costs? You know, that's a good question. That might depend on whether or not you had your data at rest encrypted. Okay, um, m maybe, maybe you don't have notification. Maybe you just have to notify HHS. I mean, that's kind of an edge case. But it's definitely a breach of this. It's definitely a violation. Let me say this. Let me let me take that back. It's definitely a violation of the security rule. Okay, whether or not it's a breach and reportable. You know, we would have to look at the, at the facts to see. Because if, you're, if your data was truly encrypted at rest and they didn't get access to your data, then you, then you should, theoretically, I wouldn't see any reason why you wouldn't still be able to take advantage of the breach notification safe harbor, which says that if you encrypt your data at rest according to the protocols provided by the Secretary of HHS, which are really NIST protocols, then you're entitled to the safe harbor. So it would definitely be a violation of the security rule, may or may not be a breach. It all depends. Um, HCCA, the FBI asked the ransomware attacks be reported to them. Well, I think you would report them to them. To yeah, them. it's a crime. I mean, it's yeah. extortion. It's extortion. You definitely need to report. I, I mean, I don't think, you know, whether... I don't know if you're. I don't know if you're a violation of any law if you don't report, right? Like if somebody breaks into your house, do you? Is it a crime to not report? Well, it's stupid not to not report, but I don't, I don't know if that it's a crime to not report, right? That, that's all we have for now. Okay. So, look, it's going to grow. That's the basic point that we've been talking about. And this is what everybody really wants to know. Okay, and it really goes back to our. Uh, um, webinar from last week it has to do with dwell time. Dwell time, okay? Dwell time is the amount of time that uh, hackers have been in your network poking around, okay? Now, sometimes hackers will poke around and and penetrate. They'll penetrate your network not because they want to steal your data, but because they want a safe launching point to launch other attacks from your network. Because if you're a major hospital or something, it's likely that your network is not blacklisted, right? And the IP addresses coming from your network are not blacklisted. So if traffic is coming from the hospital networks, there's no bells going off, at, you know, in the CIA or FBI that, hey, some, some major hack is in play, right? So, so this is the concept of assume that the perimeter is dead. You can't defend the perimeter anymore. You have to assume that the bad guys can get in, and then it all becomes a question of dwell time. Minimizing the amount of time that they're inside your network. The average, the average is 146 days. That means that the bad guys can almost get into any network at will. Are they doing bad things every time they get in? No. But they're in, and they can get in, and you can't prevent, you can't defend the parameter. So the only question is, assuming, and we have to assume that they can get in, 
what is it that we do? Okay, and so that's worth the well time, right? There's no 100% uh, solution here, but perimeter defenses aren't enough. The attack, successful attacks are going to happen. We all know that. I mean, nobody denies that. Not the government, not, not the private sector, no one. Everybody knows that the perimeter put up a firewall and a proxy server and do all that stuff. Yes, you still have to do all that stuff, but it ain't going to stop these guys, okay? So lowering the dwell time, getting them kicked out in a day or two or an hour or two is how you're going to prevent them from actually implementing ransomware. It's a much more sophisticated approach, okay? Perimeter is dead, so what? Yeah, don't abandon the firewalls and all that, but just assume that they're going to be breached. Right, and so you have to. So it, it, this is where, this is where it's beyond compliance. This is where it's war. Okay. Yes, most of the healthcare industry is not even doing the basics. But even if you were doing the basics, that ain't gonna help you with this problem. You actually have to have fairly sophisticated uh, intelligence about what is going on in your network, mon monitoring and saying, you know what? No, this pattern here we haven't seen before, or these. Why are we getting 10, 20, 30, 40 login attempts on these couple of servers, right? That's, you know, we've never seen that before. I mean, obviously, if you're getting that kind of, that, that many login attempts, something's probably wrong because, you know, it, 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 two or three login attempts usually shuts it down. And if it's a user that just did something dumb, like forgot their password, they call you up, right? So you proactively, you or someone you hire proactively have to be monitoring network patterns to make sure that you are detecting uh, when the bad guys have infiltrated, okay? And so you get into this concept of dwell time, and then it's the amount of time that you know, right? So for malware, know the, know the kill chain, right? Know how these guys get in. First they come in and they do reconnaissance. What's vulnerable here? What could we get? Is this a safe place? to uh, conduct an attack somewhere else, you know, then weaponize something, you know what I mean? Either either go ahead and say, oh, this is a hospital, look, look, they got a million records of PHI, it's unencrypted, we can both encrypt it and hold them up for ransom, and we can take these million records and sell it on the black market, right? Put in the delivery mechanism, start exploiting, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, Look, these the kill chains and kill zone, and this is this is this is the language that's used by soldiers in the military. This is now the language that security experts are using because we're at war, right? We're not at peace. This is war times when it comes to this, and that's why, you know, going back to this is probably the thing. If you're a compliance officer, you're somebody that's pushing in your organization that we need to be doing more. This is kind of arming you that we, that the U.S. government and our intelligence agencies at the national level, at the state level, at the local level, plus all private sector people, whether it's the big companies like Microsoft, Google, they all agree we are at war and this, this cyber war thing ain't going away. And this ransomware is just one manifestation of how the bad guys intend to make money from the war. Okay, All right? If you're ISIS, you're stealing oil, you're fighting for land where you can get oil, and then you're selling that oil in the black market so you can get millions of dollars to finance your operations. Right? If you're a hacker, well, this is what you're doing. You're just going to war and figuring out who's soft, how do I get in, and how do I monetize it. Okay. Now. You know, there's still there's still all kinds of ways that that hackers can get in, right? So yes, protect the perimeter, but educate your people about phishing schemes and things like that, where they voluntarily just give up their username and password, right? That's where all the, that's where the HIPAA compliance and all that. That's 101. Those are basics. You got to have that in place, or you're wandering around the desert without any hope at all of ever. Uh, making any progress on this problem, right? That's just that's just the foundation. You've got to do those things. But I guarantee you, I've been playing in this market now. I wrote the HIPAA Survival Guide in 2009, and most healthcare covered entities and business associates are still not with the program, right? Now we're in 2016. 
16 years into the 21st century, the world has changed, right? We got to get with the program and say, if we have any hope at all of making some progress in this war, we got to start thinking differently about privacy and security, right? And, and what we're going to be thinking of is in terms of war. And this is, this is one of the measures, reduce the dwell time, and if you can effectively, consistently reduce the dwell time, maybe you can get the bad guys before they implement what they need to implement to hold you up for ransom. Martin, any questions? Uh, not at this time, no. Okay, so it's getting back to, you know, well, how do we do that? Well, make sure your update, your software and firmware are updated. That's part of the security rule. Keep and test regular backups. That's part of the security rule. Utilize the principle of least privilege, right? Only on a need-to-know basis. This is security 101. It's been in the security rule forever, right? And most people aren't doing it. Most people think of the security rule, if you're in the healthcare industry, as big brother trying to be this evil, you know, overseer. And really, what the security rule is, is security 101. This is what, if you were running a data center, this is what you would do. Okay, these are the basics. Use two-factor authentication. What does that mean? Well, it's something you have, it's something you know, like a user ID and password, and something you have, like your thumbprint, or, you know, biometric, or a card, right? Something you know and something you have. That two-factor authentication has proven to be pretty robust. Implement it, right? Keep environments critical environments isolated from other environments. So maybe they broke into your uh, into one network, but they haven't gotten into the network where you store all your PHI. Okay, so you make it, you, you assume that they can get in, but once they're in, you make it more and more difficult for them to actually get to what they want to get to or to where the crown jewels are. Okay. Obviously, you're not going to be able to uh, reduce dwell time if you're not tracking it and looking at it, right? And, and this goes, and if anybody's read the security rule at all, it's already talks about monitoring uh, information system logs. You know, or it doesn't tell you how how often you should do it, but really, you should be doing it on a daily basis. It's got to be somebody's job to look at it, or you have no hope of uh, ever reducing dwell time. So the other, I mean, this is other thing. Keep up with the industry, you know, yada yada. This is not a, this is a, this is a threat landscape that's evolving on a daily basis, right? If you're not doing this, if you're a small business associate or you're a small covered entity, then you just gotta. This is the cost of doing business. You don't have the talent in house to do it, right? You you have to first of all get your compliance house in order, you know, and make up, make sure your backups are occurring. You, you know, you only give access on the need to know base. Do all the things that the security rule requires, right? Meet those 169 requirements. And let me tell you, not all 169 requirements are, you know, all that complex. Like name a privacy officer and security officer, okay? How complex is that? Train your people. Well, we sell training. We got all kinds of training. You can train your people. Okay, distribute policies and procedures. Well, you buy our subscription plan, we have policies and procedures for every requirement, for the privacy rule, for the security rule, for breach notification, right? These are tools and templates and things like that that Hip Survival Guide and some of our competitors have out there. This is not rocket. The thing that is preventing the healthcare industry from moving forward is the will and the acceptance that this is how you do business in the 21st century, and yes, you're going to have to spend some money to do it. You know, that's just a fact of life. So, um, yes, train, 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 train. So, you know, this is sort of, you know, repetition, right? That there is no, if you were looking for a silver bullet, and I, I'm, I, I'm pretty sure most of you are smart enough to know that there wasn't going to be any silver bullet here, you know, but what you have to do, the two basic things that you have to do is get into compliance so you have the foundations, the basics covered, and then implement a strategy together with a partner probably as to how you're actually going to attack dwell time, how you're going to monitor and try to identify uh, the bad guys before they're able to encrypt and, 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 and get your data as hostile. I have a couple questions. Okay. 
Um, one is relating to the off-site backup before, which you indicated uh, that could be at risk also. And the question should, was, should we keep paper charts as well? I don't think that, uh, yeah, I mean, as much as the old school docs and all that may want to go back to paper, 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 paper is dead. Paper is not going to be a, a viable solution. You just can't keep it, track it. You know, and it, it, the, the fact of the matter is that it's getting so complex with all the interactions to the electronic health record that, it, that that's that's a hopeless thing. So paper, paper, it, paper is what you may have to do in the emergency basis uh, when you can't get access to your data. But you know, it, it, I, I, I seriously doubt that you're going to be able to gather all the paper that you're going to do both. That you're going to think about it, what it means from a practical perspective as to how unlikely this really is. You're actually going to track the patient's chart electronically, and on a daily basis, you're going to track it in paper so that you can use paper as a backup. That's not going to happen, right? The, doc, the docs already hate just doing it in an electronic health record. They used to be OK doing it in paper because they didn't do most of it, and they scribbled and blah, blah, blah. They, you know, but but they're, no, no one's going to do both. So that, as a practical matter, that's, that's not going to help you. Okay, now, things that could help you is this, real-time mirroring, okay? So you have your electronic health records, and, and, um, and in real-time, pretty close to real-time, and this is doable, it's been doable for a while, you're actually mirroring all your data to some underground freaking data center in Utah, okay? And in Utah, you also have an instance of your EHR that you can boot up in a half hour, okay? And then you switch, okay? So your primary data center got hacked and encrypted and ransomed. You flip over to your, your mirrored data center, which hopefully has not been encrypted, and, and, and then you, you, know, you go out on full watch, but you're back in business in, say, an hour, right? So redundancy, redundancy, real-time redundancy, is going to be one of the big things that you can do to uh, to help defeat ransomware. But let me ask you this: all but the big hospitals, big insurance plans, Kaiser Permanente, you know, the Blues, whatever. How many how many covered entities and business associates are doing real time mirroring today? Anybody got a guess? I would say I would be surprised if the number was 5% today, right? So real-time mirroring of your data, it's not as expensive. It's not as complex as it used to be. It's just nobody's doing it, right? And so you, your, your whole IT environment has to get a lot more sophisticated than it is today. That's one of, that's one of the messages of today's webinar is, you know, if you thought that compliance with HIPAA was this necessary evil compliance problem, it is just... A, a basic um, foundation for going to war. Okay, and you, and you need to stop. You need to stop. You need to change the way you think about privacy and security if you're going to ever make any progress with respect to ransomware. So I would say real-time mirroring of data and having an instance of your an updated instance, right? So every time you get a new version of your EHR, you update the, you update your your primary system. And you update the system in Utah. So that you could flip the switch and go to that system in Utah if you, if you had to. Okay. How should uh, this goes back? How should the audit? How often should the audit logs be reviewed? You know, I'm thinking of somebody's job, and I was an, an IT, and I was responsible for for a procurement system. Okay. Uh, I used to review audit logs every day. That was just part of my job. So somebody should be reviewing logs every day. Somebody should be reviewing the network logs every day. Now, I understand the question, hey, we're clinicians. We're running a doctor's office. We don't have IT people here to do that. Yes. And in the, in the 20th century, you could get away with that. In the 21st century, you're probably going to have to outsource some of that monitoring to and pay for somebody to do that for you because that's exactly right. You don't have the skills. Your office administrator is already doing 20 jobs. And you know what? The world's changed. This is just the cost of doing business. If you still want to be using buggy whips while everybody else is driving cars, you know, good luck with that, right? You're not, you're not going to be in business very long. It's just taking the, 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 the U.S. 
U.S. healthcare industry, because of pay for performance and you know paying and managing populations, it's gone through 150 years of change in five. I mean, the amount of change that this, the industry is being turned upside down with like population management, accountable care organizations, and so on and so forth. Okay, and part of that change is, unfortunately, you know. 21st century thinking about privacy and security. So you're not, and you're not going to get away with it. And, and to, you know, to be sure, that's why one of many reasons. But that's why a lot of small practices are being bought up and going away. That they're just not sophisticated enough to play in the 21st century, and so they're being bought up. That's it, Martin. Nope. Does, doesn't the cloud store data in various places, and wouldn't that help? Yeah, well, that's what that was the real-time mirroring. I'm assuming that that would be in the cloud, right? Yeah. And, and but 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 so your primary system's on the cloud too, but it got hacked and it got encrypted, and so they're holding you up for ransom. One of the things you could do is say, okay, well, you know, we're not going to pay the ransom because we can just flip over here to the cloud in Utah and that mountain under Utah. And we're going to use that system. So yeah, that, that'd be an assumption there that all of it was on cloud. And the yeah. cloud does help. Yes, absolutely. And the last question is, how do you monitor the mirror so it has not been hacked and ransomed as well? Well, I mean, if if the mirror was if the mirror was ransomed, then you would know it because they're going to tell you. You know, we hey, we also got your mirror, so don't think about doing that. And how could you tell that it's that 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 your mirror hasn't been um, attacked? Is just turn on the mirror and see if you can get to your data. If you can use your decryption keys and get to your data, then obviously they haven't encrypted your encryption or encrypted your data, and all is good, right? It's a simple test. Can we get to our data, right? And mirroring. Mirroring is pretty uh, reliable. It's sophisticated technology, but it's been around for well over a decade now. Let me tell you, this is not rockets. I mean, Cisco, database vendors, we, we know how to do this stuff now. Okay, It's just a question of will and money. And in fact, the money is even getting cheaper and cheaper because storage is getting cheaper and cheaper. Right? It's just the thinking that hasn't evolved. Our, our level of sophistication as to how we think about privacy and, and security has not caught up with the technology that's available to do it. That's the good news here. Okay, that the technology that's available to do it is getting cheaper all the time. What's getting more expensive is having the talent, the right people in place to actually make it happen. That's all the questions I have. Okay, I'm going to go through our, our, our uh, shameless plug. We got a product called uh, Expresso, the Risk Assessment Express. It's going to be shipping now about the middle of uh, June. It's going to make doing HIPAA compliant risk assessments about as easy as you can make, and we think you'll be able to do a valid risk assessment uh, in two or three hours. And if you and to be able to do even like a basic risk assessment, because there's no requirement to do a perfect risk assessment. Okay, you just have to do one. And HHS understands that you're going to get better and better and better at doing your risk assessment. So, you know, we built this Espresso so that you can get better and better and better at doing risk assessments. It's a cloud-based uh, offering. It will store as many risk assessments as you care to do. It will link up with security objects, et cetera, et cetera. Here are some of the screens. They've actually changed in color a little bit. But security objects are all those things that you want to protect. Your, uh, your phones, your pads, your servers, uh, your networks, your people, etc. cetera. Um, devices is just a, a, a category, one category of a security object. Okay, so here is like the kinds of things you could, that we call security objects, devices, places, persons, networks, processes. All these things are covered by the security rule. We, we treat them as security objects because people generally think of, oh, we got to gather an inventory and and all they're thinking about is hardware. And you can see that a place, a building, is a security object. A person, your workforce, is a security object. A network is a security object. A process can be a security object. Okay, And then we pre-populate Espresso with known threats and vulnerabilities. Actually, we, we do this matter-antimatter thing. Every implementation specification of the security rule is actually a control. 
okay, that you should have implemented. If you don't have that control, then you have a threat and a vulnerability pair. The threat is, you know, the threat is I may a, a hurricane may strike. The vulnerability is I don't have a backup system, okay, and that backup system is required by the security rules. And so we load up all the all the threats and vulnerabilities, a large subset that we know you have to implement for the security rule. And and keep in mind that a risk assessment is only an analysis step. You're not actually remediating. You're just taking stock of what your risks are. So because we pre-populate with the known threats and risks that cover the security rule, we give you a strong foundation to be able to do uh, a, a quick risk assessment but then build and do as, as sophisticated a risk assessment as you care to do because you can add your own threats, your own vulnerabilities, uh, et cetera, et cetera, going forward. So uh, we should be shipping in the middle of, uh, of June. It has changed our subscription right now, including Espresso and all our products. It's $24.95 a year, and it's $12.95 for optional every year after that optionally okay uh, we like to think at the hip survival guide that we provide the recipe and not just the ingredients we provide a ton of educational products you can execute on starting on day one they're all agile they're agnostic as to whether you're a, a covered entity or a business associate they're wetware they actually tell you how you should go about complying as opposed to just what like many of you have probably looked at the NIST documents and you know, NIST has document implementing the security rule. And for every requirement, instead of telling you how, which the government is never going to tell you, they're never going to tell you how, because because they don't want to get in the, in the in the position of saying, well, I did it just how you told me, and now you're saying I'm not compliant. They're never going to tell you how. So what the NIST documents do for every requirement is they say, here's the 30 questions that you should be asking yourself. And I'm like, well, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, that really helps me. You know, no, we provide you step-by-step -step instructions as to how you should be go about complying with these 169 requirements. And now we're going to have espresso on top of that. And you should look to see other uh, modules. Once we have the risk assessment in place, we're probably going to have a, a, a um, breach notification engine, and we're going to be adding to the subscription without changing the price. So uh, with that, I'm going to just open it back up in case people have questions about Expresso. There is a quick question about Expresso. Will it let us run reports? There's no uh, point, no indication what kind of reports. Yes, this was at. really this was really early. We have a working prototype uh, now. This is really early. I mean, this is like this is like two months ago now. These where these screens came from. You'll be able to do uh, uh, comprehensive uh, risk assessment reports. Like for this risk assessment, which risks did I identify what controls that I identify that I would implement to uh, reduce this risk? You know whether the risk uh, were high, medium, or low. What security objects were these controls applied to? There'll be a comprehensive set of reports that you can just kind of point, click, and report. That should satisfy uh, HHS as at least show that you haven't stuck your head in the ground and that you were, you know, you did a risk assessment. Okay, is it the is it a perfect risk assessment? No, but it's a, it's a valid risk assessment, and is it a risk assessment that you can improve on? Yes. You have a system in place that will help you improve on it? Yes. Okay, so even right out of the box. So our existing subscribers um, just get Espresso and we didn't up their subscription fee. All right, so right off the bat, we're going to have, you know, I don't know, 200 some odd users using the product, uh, and hopefully we can... Um, uh, you know, make it mature really quick because we're already going to have a user base. Uh, you know, as, as soon as uh, it's shipping. No more questions at this point. All right. Thank you um, for attending. It's been my pleasure being with you guys today. Thank you.